All right, so today we're gonna to spend a little bit of time, and uh, when I say a little bit, I really mean a little bit, this uh, on section four. This is the part of this chapter that we spend the least amount of time on, uh, and there's some reasons for that. Um, namely because a lot of the things that are addressed in section four are things that uh, we will go over in much greater detail in another chapter later in the course. But there are a few things here that we want to connect with uh, this whole era of reform with section four. In fact, as, as you read section four, took the notes on it, and did the worksheets and things, my guess is, is that you are probably on some level wondering like, okay, how do we get talking about all of this factories and, and, and workers and all that kind of stuff when we're doing a chapter on the era of reform? And there is a little bit of, I can understand that, there is a little bit of a disconnect. So I want to make the connection. And the connection is that uh, while most of what we're talking about in this era are, are reforms that deal with social issues, things in society, things like the slavery issue, things like education, things like uh, rights and liberties of women and others, this, um, that's all about change happening in our society, right, in those areas. Well, this last section focuses mainly on economics, but what it focuses on is this massive change that our country went through in the early 1800s in terms of the way the economy ran. So we're going to talk about uh, these first two bullets, and one of the things that I'll highlight is just how these things create this economic reform, this change. Okay, so uh, what I had to do was go through uh, the worksheet for section four and... Uh, as I said, we're going to spend less time on this uh, than we did compared to the other sections. And so we're not even going to cover every single thing that you read about and answered questions about. I'm going to streamline it, which is what I've done here with these few bullet points. What I think you should do is have your worksheet out that you completed and also have your notes out and add these things into your notes because we're going to take everything on that worksheet and sort of pinpoint the most significant pieces that you need to have. All right, so, uh, for example, uh, the, the very first box in the worksheet that you had to do for Section 4 gave you an effect, and you had to identify the cause. And the effect says, the cottage industry system declines and dies. So you had to uh, come up with what caused that to happen. And so, the first bullet point I have here is that the cottage industry dies. And one of the reasons that uh, that happened um, that you may have put in that first box is that there was uh, um, all kinds of new inventions and new technologies. So if you had anything about mechanized equipment or inventions or technologies, that's really you know what you need to have in that first uh, box. You may have even put something in there uh, um, about the system that replaced the cottage industry system. So when the cottage industry died, that gave way to the rise of what system? So maybe you put something in there about the rise of the factory system. So just quickly to, to understand the difference between this old cottage industry and this new factory system, the cottage industry works this way. Uh, this was a, a manufacturing system where goods and products were manufactured in people's cottages, in their homes. And so the way it worked is this. Let's just say... Uh, well, I'm going to skip down here to this third bullet. What was the first industry that Section 4 talked about being affected by this change? It was the textile industry. So textiles are any fabrics. So any clothes that you're wearing, my sweater, um, the flag that I have hanging here, my, my curtains on the window, that's all uh, what we would consider to be textile. So that's the first industry that was affected. The first one that went through this big change. So let's talk about how the factory or the how the um, cottage industry system would work using that example. So let's say we want to make textiles. Let's say we're going to make sweatshirts. All right, that's what our village uh, is going to produce as a product. So the way it would work in the cottage industry system is you would have somebody that um, was, let's say, and I'm going to simplify this, but you'll get the idea with this analogy. That's uh, somebody uh, would be a spinner. So what that means is all of this cotton would be delivered to your cottage. And if you were the spinner, you had some tools and some equipment in your cottage that allowed you to take raw cotton and spin it out into threads. Well, once you do that, do we have sweatshirts? 
No, there's no sweatshirt yet, right? So then what would happen is all this thread that was spun at the spinner's cottage would be picked up and transported to another cottage. And the person that worked in that cottage would be a weaver. And they would have some tools and some equipment and, and maybe even some machinery, but primitive stuff. And they would uh, take all of that thread and they would know how to weave it into fabric. So now we've got these big sheets of cloth. Sweatshirts? Not yet. Then we would take all of this cloth, all this fabric to another cottage. And let's say uh, someone there uh, had skills in dyeing the cloth three or four different colors. And they would have the chemicals and the minerals and the, the equipment to dye it. Well, now we have sweat. Well, no, we don't have sweatshirts. We just have dyed cloth. So then you take all that cloth over to the next cottage. And in that cottage, maybe somebody uh, has a, the equipment to cut it into different patterns of fabric. And then those patterns would now be delivered to another cottage. And let's say that in that cottage, somebody was a seamstress or a seamster, and they would sew the, uh, the um, patterns of fabric into, holy cow, finally we have a sweatshirt. And when it comes out of that end of that last cottage, we have sweatshirts. Now, what can you say about that system? Just by the way I, I, I described it, it was slow, it was inefficient, and it ended up being very expensive. There's a lot of labor involved, a lot of time, and those sweatshirts, when they were finally produced, were going to be very expensive to purchase. That's how we did things in the cottage industry system. Again, simplified. And what happens is that will die out and we're gonna have a new system, a factory system. And the way that works is this. And again, this is sort of a simplification of it, but I think you get the idea. At some point, somebody invented some new technology, some new machine that could weave thread into fabric way faster than the old weaver could do it in their cottage. That's great, but only one step of that process has been sped up. So you've got the weaver has this new piece of equipment and can weave thread real fast. The problem is once they weave all that thread and send it to the next cottage, what are they doing? They're sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting for more thread to come to their cottage because the spinner is still doing it the same old way, real slow and by hand spinning the thread. So what has to happen? We have to invent a new machine that helps the spinning part of the process go faster. And then once the spinner can do it real fast and the weaver can do it real fast, guess what? We can't be waiting on the person to die and so on and so forth. And so what happens is sort of this chain reaction. One thing leads to another and you see the invention of all these different types of new technologies and equipments and machines. The problem is a lot of these machines, there's two problems with them, are massive, they're huge. Guess what? They don't fit in someone's living room in their cottage. And they end up being pretty expensive. So it's not like just an average Joe Schmo worker in the village can afford to buy this new spinning jenny as it was called. So what ends up happening is we have to figure out a place to put these big giant machines and a way to make it affordable and a fit. And all of a sudden somebody says, hey, maybe we just build a huge building and we put all the machines in one location where they all fit. And that was the simplified version of how the factory was created. And from there, the factory system sort of takes over the way that we manufacture goods. As we said, the first industry to be affected by all this, and that's why I used the sweatshirt analogy, was the textile industry. But eventually, this new change and this new economic reform that's happening is going to happen in all different types of businesses. Now, um, if you're going to talk about the beginning of the textile industry in America, this switch that was happening, you have to talk about Sam Slater. Your book doesn't mention Sam Slater, which is why I had you read that short biography of him and answer those few questions about Sam Slater. So that's what this next bullet point here is. It's just a reminder to look at the Sam Slater worksheet. So I just want to go over one thing, a little uh, review of one thing from that worksheet. Sam Slater is kind of like the Industrial Revolution James Bond, if you will, because in his story you learn that he brings all of his knowledge and information about this textile manufacturing from England. At the time, England was leading the world in textile manufacturing. They had already gone through this system and they had already invented the equipment and the machines and the processes. Um, and so they were killing it. They were exporting textiles all over the world. Well, because of that, you learned that they had laws in England they restricted any information and or any workers in that textile industry from leaving that country. So Sam Slater had to 
Number one, sneak out of the country, disguised himself, and he had to sneak out of England and make it his way across the ocean to the United States without getting caught. And two, he couldn't bring any blueprints or written documentation or pictures or anything, drawings, because if he got caught with any of that, he would get uh, uh, in trouble with the law. So he had to memorize everything he learned about building a textile factory and the machines and the equipment. And when he got to the United States, he pulled it all out of his brain and put it down on paper and built a factory. Uh, it's just a fascinating story about the uh, beginning of the textile industry here in the United States. So hopefully you enjoyed learning a little bit about Sam Slade. All right, so the last thing that I wanna cover is just how this new change started to affect the everyday working class people that found themselves no longer working in their 